Captain, once again, uh, I'm just so delighted that this past weekend, I love what Joe McGee says in his marriage bill. He says, you don't find a marriage, you build one. And, uh, and Joe McGee has uh, six children. He's got five girls and one boy and a, and a lovely wife, Denise. And he's been doing a great job. He speaks all on Daystar television. He has books. He's been all around and, and uh, comes to my, goes to my, some of my favorite churches and speaks. And it's such an honor and a privilege to have Pastor Joe McGee here with us to Cornerstone Church. Will you please welcome a warm Cornerstone welcome to Pastor Joe McGee. Good morning. It's good to be in Connecticut. You know, when I come up here, I always wonder why people went west. You ever wonder about that? You ever been to California? Everybody in California is coming back this direction now. I'm not sure what that's about, but they are. But um, I always thought, you know, if, if you landed up here, you know, Plymouth Rock, and started the country, and kind of started migrating, like, I wouldn't have left Connecticut. I would have stayed right here, man. You live in one of those beautiful states in the nation. So uh, God bless you. You're a blessed people. Now, we do uh, seminars on the family. Um, I worked as an engineer for about 10 years, and uh, God called us into the ministry. And uh, so we went back to school, sold our house, started all over again. And worked in a, a local church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and worked with kids, teenagers, and families. And we noticed something. Uh, we were one of the first mega churches in Oklahoma. Back in the late 70s, we were running about 30, 34, 3,500 people. And we didn't know why they were coming. People said, why are they coming? So we don't know. They just keep showing up. We're not sure. They said, we do have a bus program. I said, yes, we do. We have three Sunday morning services. We have three buses at each service, but we do not bus anybody to the church. We bus them away from the church. We had to rent out a shopping center about a mile from our building to put the kids in because we didn't have room in our building. One of the things we noticed as a staff, though, for all the great things that happened on Sunday, people getting saved and restored to fellowship, filled with the Holy Spirit, people giving, going on mission trips, for all the great things that happened on Sunday, Monday through Friday, our offices were, uh, were packed with counseling, our own people. You know, marriages are in trouble, kids are in trouble, teens are in trouble. It's like, if we're doing so good on Sunday, what happened to money? Did it leak out of our brain Sunday night on our pillow? And uh, what happened? And you realize something, the devil hates the family. And, uh, you know, it's the first thing he went after. Adam and Eve got fired from their job, evicted from their house, and their kids started killing each other. And that's in Genesis. And it's, it's, it's a long story. You've got to go to Revelation to read through it. But right in the middle was a great story, Silent Night, Holy Night, We Through Kings of Orinar, and God had a plan. And so he sent his son to earth so he could be saved and restored and now we're part of the body of Christ. We're the ones that are helping people. We're not, a, we're not afraid of hell. We're actually looking for it. Jesus said, Matthew, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. We're not a defensive people. Uh, angels surround us everywhere we go. God's our rear guard. We only play offense. We never play defense. Jesus said this, I'm going to build my church, and here's what we're going to do. Uh, we're going we're to feed the hungry, give water to the thirsty. We're going to help orphans. We're going to help widows. We're going to nurse sick people back to health. We're going to visit people in prison. So what are you doing? Well, we're, we're pretty much fixing hell every day. And so every day you get up, what are you going to do today? Well, I, I think I'll try to fix some hell somewhere. It, it's what I'm here for. But if you're not in the mode of fixing it, you're griping about it. You know, like, because I got a big family. My dad had 12 brothers and sisters, so did my father-in-law. So we're the only ministers in the whole family. So if something happens, they call us. And they got a lot of questions, you know. I said, well, you know, if you were in church, you wouldn't have so many questions. You know, you might read your Bible every now and then instead of just carrying it around. It's a really good book. It has some great stuff in it. And, and they're wanting to know, well, why did God let this happen? I said, well, God's not really in charge. Satan's in charge. He took over the planet when Adam and Eve sinned, and he kills, steals, and destroys. And, uh, but we're not part of him anymore. We've been born again, taken out of the kingdom of darkness, placed in the kingdom of God's dear son. And so I noticed working on local church staff that it was the family that was the biggest issue. If you bust a family, uh, you're going to bust a community. You bust a community, you bust a city, you bust a city, you bust a state, you bust a state, you bust a nation. So God promised in Malachi in the last days, here's what I'm going to do. Before Jesus comes back, I'm going to pour out my spirit on all flesh. The sons and daughters are going to prophesy and dream dreams and have visions. I'm going to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children, the hearts of the children back to the fathers. I've always believed that the last great day revival will be among the family. God's going to put families back together because the family got broke and got busted, you know. If you just read the stats, you know, I'm a no statistician because I love my job as an engineer, but it's the same thing in ministry. What's the family doing? Well, 
divorces are going up. You know, you want to name any crime, it's going up. What happened? Well, the devil doesn't like people. So, well, we're part of the answer. So we ought to be downright excited to do something about this. Now, I wanted a big family. Coming from one, I, I wanted one. I, I don't want to grow old by myself. I want somebody to come take me to dinner and send me on a cruise and you know, buy me something for Christmas. <laughs> Seriously, I do. You owe me. And so, <laughs> and so uh, we got pictures. We got those kids. We got that. I got my five daughters. I got, we got five girls and a boy. Now, people said, how did that happen? Well, we wanted five kids. Nisha and I got married. I asked her, said, you want to have any children? She said, yeah. And then she said, well, how many do you want? And I said, well, I don't know. You're the one that's going to have them. How many do you want? She said, I'd like to have five. I said, five, that's good. You get all those in the back of a pickup truck. That's good. <laughs> she said, when would you like to have them? I said, well, baby, you're the one that's going to have them. When would you like to have them? She said, well, I want to wait five years till we have more money and a decent house and you're, you know, a decent car to drive. And uh, So sure enough, January 1st, five years later, we had our first baby. And then uh, 18 months later, we had our second baby. We were driving home from the hospital. And I was just thinking, I said, hey, you remember that conversation we had seven years ago about having five kids? She said, yes. I said, well, forget that. I've got one. You've got one. That's plenty. That's enough. But, you know, five years later, our second child went off to kindergarten. We hadn't been alone in a long time. So nine months and two days later, we had another baby. <laughs> I hope I don't have to explain that to you. But anyhow... Uh, so anyhow, people said, well, well we, got, we got six. Now, where's the one? That's, now, that's my son. That's number six. People said, you keep trying to you had a boy? I said, goodness, no. I just forgot the three kids. I had no male James in me. You got the one with the five girls? Ah, uh, there they are. Bless their heart. Now, when you're a father, you're special. Girls love their father. Over here on the right, that's Sarah Elizabeth. That was our firstborn. She came out smart, you know. She never did talk baby talk. Pass the oatmeal. Okay, here you go. <laughs> And she taught all my other children how to read. She loved to read. So Sarah just got her doctorate two years ago. She's a college professor at Northeastern State. She was always smart. Just came out that way. Jessica, the blonde, I thought the hospital made a mistake. I thought there's no way she's my kid. Because you know how it is when you're a parent. Your first kid shows up and you never learn about them. You know, about the time they, you learn to raise a five-year-old, they turn six. You learn to raise a six-year-old, they turn seven. You just chase the first one. Then you write them a letter. I'm sorry, I didn't know. You were the guinea pig. And so you learn. So the second one shows up. Now I know what to do, but the hospital makes a mistake. They give you somebody else's baby. There's no way this is your kid because they're nothing like the firstborn. And you realize, no, it is yours. Trust me, in the DNA, it's yours. And so, so Jessica came out. Now she was smart, but not like Sarah. Jessica was an athlete. And uh, Sarah goes somewhere, she'd dress up immaculate, put everything on, do everything just. Jessica would put on sweats and a bobby pin in her hair. The, the, we're not dressing up. But everybody loved Jessica. She loved to make them laugh. And uh, Jessica was a great athlete. So Sarah went to college on an academic scholarship. And Jessica was three-point shooting champion in Oklahoma, an all-state basketball player. So she went to college on a basketball scholarship. And then Corey, all the way over on the, on the left, Corey's my middle child. And she hated that. And she'd tell me, I hate being a middle child. I hate it. I said, why? I don't get anything new. I don't get anything new. Everything's a hand-me-down. That's right. We bought good stuff. It still fits. Put it on. And, and so and she, she, she could run her mouth. Now, Corey, uh, Corey owns half my publishing company today because she's real good with her mouth. She's good with words. So she's going to college. She says, you're going to major in journalism. You're going to put your mouth to work. We're going to let that mouth make money for you. Now, Corey never, never said a cuss word, never said a bad word or a whole lot. But she could cut you verbally. You could be in a conversation with her. She could slice you up like, like a sharp knife. And I'd look. I said, did you just cut me? And she what? I said, did you just cut me verbally? I don't know, Dad. How did you take it? I don't know. How did you mean it? I don't know. How did you take it? Yep, you're going to be a journalism major. So, you know, she got out of college. We put that, we put that gift to work. And Corey was so sweet, so petite, she got kicked out of every basketball game and every soccer match she was in because she would trip people. Now, she never yelled, never screamed, never got mad, never lost her temper. She just tripped you. She was real good. The rest finally got wise to her about a year and a half into her school. And so she didn't finish too many games. In the middle is Tessa. Tessa's my medical child. She loved medical shows growing up. She wanted to watch some operation, somebody's heart land out on their chest and stuff. And I said, turn that stuff off. No, Dad, isn't that fascinating? No, it's not fascinating. Turn that off. So she wanted to major in something in the medical field, in the administration. So she did. She went to college and a uh, uh, medical major. And, uh, and so she'd work at camp in the summertime and said, I'd call her, how'd your day go? Dad, it's an awesome day. 12 stitches, three broke bones. We put an eyeball back in. It was awesome today. I said, that's gross. That's all I want to know. So she's done hurt her husband. We're going to Uganda here next week on a medical missions trip. 
And uh, then Lauren, the girl next to her, uh, Lauren just graduated college last week, and uh, she was the odd one. She would get up in the morning and uh, put on five layers of clothes like she couldn't make up her mind. We live out in the country in Oklahoma, and I'd look out my bay window, and she'd be out in the backyard twirling around a tree, singing to squirrels and stuff. And I told Denise, it's not right. We ran out of good jeans. We ran out of good jeans. <laughs> and I'd say, kind of make your mind of what you want to wear. And she'd like to wear all kinds of stuff. And so eventually when she got into junior high, I'm about to go into high school, I said, honey, what do you want to major in? We've got to get you ready for college. And she said, I want to major in interior design. I'm sorry, what do you want to major in? Interior design. I said, I don't know what that is. What is that? Well, people hire me to design the interior of their corporations, their buildings, their homes. Somebody pays for that? They said, yes, and nobody's going to pay me. I'm going to go to Walmart, get a gallon of paint, I'll paint my own room. I don't need somebody to tell me what color to paint it. And so I fought her on that. I said, no, the world's dying, going to hell. You're going to major something to help somebody. She said, well, I'll get back with you because she's the fifth one. She's real smart. So about three months later, she showed up. Dad, have a seat. She has a stack of scriptures that will choke a horse. So sit down here. And so what is this? So when Dad, when you get to heaven, you're going to be impressed. Uh, the gates of heaven are made out of pearl, one solid pearl. Biggest source you've ever seen, one solid pearl. The streets are paved with gold so pure you can see through them. Around the throne of God are four angels with six wings, not two, and eyeballs on every side of their head. There's a laser light show going on behind the throne made out of emerald green. Martha Stewart did not decorate heaven. God decorated heaven. He's real gaudy. Then she had all the scriptures on the temple and on the tabernacle. And finally, after an hour, she had buried me. I said, fine, major in interior design. I don't care. It'll be good. And she's probably going to make more money than mother five kids combined. She just got her first job right out of college, and it's looking really good. And I was wrong. So, you know, as a parent, you don't always hit home runs. John came along when John popped out. We didn't, I never wanted to know what the babies were until they came out. People said, do you want to know? I said, no, I don't want to know. That's like opening your Christmas present Christmas Eve. That's cheating. I don't want to know until he pops out when John popped out. And I got me a mail. So I got all excited. And they slammed on the table, and they cut the cord. And I said, it's a boy, Denise. We've got a, we have a male child. The family line is going to continue. You know? And she started to cry. Denise never cried when she had a baby. So what's wrong, baby? What's wrong? And she muttered something. I thought, what are you crying about? She said, we'll have to have another one. I said, what? We'll have to have another one. He'll need somebody to play with. I said, he's got five sisters. He's in good shape. That'll be fine. <laughs> and the girls made sure he was all male, man. They worked him over, buddy. And when John was young, even at age five, I remember people come up, are all these children yours? I said, yes. And you have a boy? And yes, we do. And people would bend over at church and say, what's your name? And John would just, he'd just poker face you. He'd just look at you. So what's your name? He'd stand off some of his sisters and say, his name's John. <laughs> well, how old are you, John? He'd poke her face again. And somebody said, he's five. And John learned early, keep your mouth shut. The women will talk for you. <laughs> and so he's always real quiet. He's actually my total opposite. But John's my second best friend next to my wife. And uh, the girls made sure he, he only dated one girl, you know, his whole life, you know. And, uh, and he's, uh, he's got him a good woman. And so the ladies prepared him. So it turned out to be real good. And then the other got a picture of my, uh, just Denise and I. I'm, that's my wife. That's the love of my life. Now, we fell in love early, real early. I married her for just some basic reasons. I was dropping my sister off at a softball tournament one day and going to go bail some hay, and I didn't date in school. Uh, we were poor, poor. I didn't get my driver's license until I was 18, and um, I finally had my driver's license. I got a car. I'm in freshman year at the University of Tennessee. And all of a sudden, I'm dropping my sister off, and this gal comes walking across the front of my car, and she's got her ball uniform and got her glove and her tennis shoes in her hand, and I'm just going to give her time to walk by. And she just looked up at me when she walked by, and when she looked up, I was smitten. I thought, whoa, whoa. Now, my wife said I stalked her for two months, but I didn't, because that word had not been invented yet. It was not in the Webster Dictionary. <laughs> I just followed her around. I didn't stalk her. And, um, and then she finally asked me if I was going to ask her out on a date one night, and I said yes, and I finally went to her house, and I realized that she not only she looked good, but she smelled good, and she, she cooked good. So I went three nights in a row to eat dinner with her. And so the third night, I'm leaving the home, and I'm walking out of the house. I got about halfway down the sidewalk. She's standing at the front door, and she said, long before the country song ever came out, she said, are you going to kiss me or not? And I looked back, and I said, yes. And when I kissed her, I realized she kissed good. We do not have six children because we love children. And I realized she kissed good, and I said, let's get married. And she said yes, and that's how we got married. And so that's why we were ready for a divorce three years into our marriage, because I didn't know her, and she didn't know me. And, man, we would yell and scream and holler, and my friends would say, what's wrong with your marriage? I said, I married a she-bear. 
I married a mean old she bear. And so, well, she sure is pretty. Yeah, I know she is. And the devil's good looking too. Did you ever read that in Isaiah? The devil's good looking. That doesn't mean anything. Thank God somebody got us back in a great local church, and church saved our life. Church is the most powerful thing on this planet this morning. If God's doing anything on this planet, He's doing it through the body of Christ. We are what's happening. We're the salt and we're the light. We got back in, I realized the problem my marriage wasn't my wife, it was me. I didn't know what a real man was or how he's supposed to act or what he's supposed to do. Same thing with Denise. And so what we try to do is pass that on to our children. Because I always believe in the last days, children are going to be the biggest thing going on. The devil's always, he'll, let the, he, he'll, he'll wait one generation and let everybody die off. So hang with me here while I violate a few laws of public speaking to do this. Um, when I became an education director at a church, I said, what do I do? He said, well, you teach families. Teach them what? what? Whatever they need to know. What do they need to know? Because we were very unorganized back then. So just from the questions they would ask, you realize the family's broke. We don't know what we're doing, especially the kids. So we started working with young people. And, um, and I kind of learned this. I went back and put the scriptures together. I thought, well, what did the Bible say about this? So we got all the way back to Genesis, and God said he picked Abraham. God picks an old man. He couldn't even have babies. He's old. His wife's old. She can't have any babies. So I'm going to pick him to start a whole race of people with. Why? Well, I know him. What do you know about him? Well, Genesis 18, 19, he will teach his children and his grandchildren and all those in his household about me. What I'm about to give him, he won't grow old and die with. He's going to pass it on to the next generation. Now, Abraham was not a perfect man. We know just from the chapters leading up to this point, he lied a lot and he tried to give his wife away twice. So, you know, God started, with, well, he's kind of wacky. He tried to give his wife away twice and he lies a lot. Yeah, but he will teach his children. So we're going to go with that. And so then you begin to go through all the scriptures of what God said. And, you know, uh, Deuteronomy 6 talks about, I command you to teach your children when you wake up, sit down, lie down, walk by the way. I command you to teach your children 24 hours a day. Psalm 78, I command you to teach your children to the fifth generation that they might have hope in God and not be like their fathers who forgot me and my ways and my works and my wonders. And even though they were armed with bows and arrows in the day of battle, they turned back for they had leanness in their soul. Proverbs 22, 6, train up a child in the way they should go. When they're old, they won't depart from it. Ephesians 6, 1 through 4, children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with a promise that it will be well with you and you live long. So you can stand here all day long and quote scriptures. God was always concerned with the next generation. The church is one generation away from being dead. A nation's one generation away from being dead. A corporation's one generation away from being dead. Our job is to pass on the faith to the next generation. So I'm going to say, well, how did God plan this out? So I go back, and this is Luke chapter 2. It's real simple. Luke chapter 2, this is the story of Jesus. So, well, if we're going to find out how God believed in parenting, he knew there'd be kids. So God comes to earth as a baby, you know, got to take uh, Adam's place. The first Adam lost, the second Adam's going to get it back. So this is Luke chapter 2. I'm reading from the New Living Translations. This is Jesus when he was 12 years old. Jesus is 12. Silent night, holding night's gone. The wise men have left. You know, they went down to Egypt and they've come back up. So Jesus can't raise a dead frog. He can't walk on a pond. He's just a normal kid. But this time Mary and Joseph had three other boys, naturally. So we've got a house full of boys here. And so they go down to Jerusalem every year to the festival. We're going to go down for the eight-day festival. It's about a four-day march down there, about a four-day march home. You've got to be committed for a couple of weeks to make this happen. So this is what I'm just going to pick up here in uh, Luke chapter 2, uh, verse 41. Every year, Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem for the Passover festival. When Jesus was 12 years old, they went as usual to the festival. After the celebration was over, they started home to Nazareth. Now, you have to understand, I grew up in a very big family. Family reunions all the time. As soon as you got to the family farm, my grandfather had 400 acres up in East Tennessee. Kids scattered. We ran to the barn, ran down to the pasture trying to find a horse to ride or a goat to throw rocks at or something. Parents didn't know where we were. They didn't care as long as we're not around them. They know we're going to show up when things over. Well, it's going to be an all-day event with so the kids scattered. So in any big event like this, parents, where's the kids at? Well, they're around here somewhere. They're, they're with somebody. They're with a cousin or an uncle or somewhere. So they're, Mary and Joseph aren't worried. They just assume he's with them. Lots of families would go together in a big caravan. The reason you went to the festival in the caravan is because it's a real dangerous road. This is before street lights and policemen. So there's thugs and thieves and robbers on that highway. You always went with a lot of people. You don't go by yourself. You had to stop before dark. There's no Coleman lanterns, no flashlights. You got to set up camp, get your food cooked, and get ready for bed. And then the sun up, you got up and you did it again. So this is a kind of a dangerous four day journey going down through this thing. So his parents didn't miss him at first. They just assumed, you know, he's with some relatives or among the other uh, relatives somewhere. When they couldn't, when he didn't show up that evening, they started to look for him among their relatives and friends. 
When they could not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to search for him there. Three days later they finally discovered him in the temple sitting among the religious leaders, listening to them and asking questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and at his answers. His parents did not know what to think at first. Son, his mother said to him, why have you done this to your father and I? When moms are mad they always drag dad's name in on the thing. Why have you done this to your father and I? We have been frantic searching for you everywhere. Jesus said as a 12 year old boy, why did you need to search? He asked, did you not know that I must be in my father's house? Or the King James says, did you not know I need to be about my father's business? They did not understand what he meant. He returned to Nazareth with them, was obedient to them, and his mother stored all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature and in favor of God and favor of man. So here it is in essence. You're going down here, Jesus has been 12 years in a row, it's 12th year he's been to this thing. Thing ends, everybody's okay, we're headed home. Festival shut down at noon. So about noon they start to leave, pack up the donkey, get everything together. They're going to go about four hours, stop before dark. So they've gone four hours from Jerusalem, put up the tent. You guys saying there's noise everywhere. There's donkeys and camels and stuff and fires and it's, it's just a mess. Just tons of people. Mary's got dinner ready. Joseph, get the boys in here. It's time to eat. Joseph hollers for the boys. The three young ones come in. No Jesus. So Mary says, where's Jesus at? Get him in there. It's time to eat dinner. He said, I hollered for him. I'll go get him. And Joseph disappears. He comes back at dark. Mary says, where have you been? He says, well, I've been looking for Jesus. Where's he at? Well, I don't know. What do you mean he's not? Go get him and bring him. No, you don't understand. He, he's not here. He's what? He, he's not here. What do you mean he's not here? He's not here. I've been from one end of the camp. He's not here. I, I think we've left him in Jerusalem. We left him in Jerusalem? We left Jesus in Jerusalem. We could have left one of these. We left that one. Yeah, there was a lot of verbiage they didn't put in the Bible, but it happened. <laughs> they didn't sleep that night. So early the next morning, they pass off the boys to some other family member. They hoof it back to Jerusalem. A four-hour run going back. Friend, we have lost sight of not holding out the Son of the living God. Where did we lose him? Well, they go to Jerusalem. The Bible says for three days they look for him. Now, where do you look for a 12-year-old kid? A bowling alley, a pool hall, a movie theater? I don't know where they look. But they're looking frantic, and they can't find him. So three days later, Jesus has been gone for four days. They've lost the Son of God. They're out of breath. and like, where have we not looked? Where have we not looked? We've looked everywhere. And I can just imagine, Joe, well, we didn't look at church. You know, he's not normal. Maybe he's hanging out down in church. And they walk down to the temple, and there he sits. And Mom says, why have you done this to us? Well, Mama, he didn't do it to you. You left him. Why have you done this? We've been frantic looking for you. And Jesus very simply said, well, didn't you know I need to be about my father's business? What's Jesus doing? Well, the 12-year-old Jesus is trying to find out who he is. He doesn't know who he is. God didn't cheat. God came to earth. God put his son in that mother's womb, and he popped out nine months later. Who's in there? The second member of the Godhead, the creator of the universe, made the 93 billion known galaxies, holds everything together by the power of his word. But then that kid's soul, he doesn't know who he is yet. He's no different than you and I, our children. You have to learn who you are in him, in whom, in Christ. You have to grow in the grace and knowledge of God. Even God didn't cheat. So what's the 12 year old Jesus doing? Trying to figure out who he is. All of a sudden he gets to 30. You go to the two chapters over and Jesus is 30. He's running the carpenter shop. He was the local Home Depot. Okay, he wasn't just a sissy guy in a wooden hammer and a white sheet. He's what's happening. All the family work for Jesus. So they build everything. Chairs, beds, door frames, post on your boat. You need it, the carpenter boy, he'll, he'll build it for you. All of a sudden the, the brothers come into the house, and I'm paraphrasing, but you can read it and, and look for it. Mom, you got to do something. Jesus is not down at the shop. People need the furniture, and he's not down there. When he's not down there? Well, he's not down there. He's in town doing some weird stuff. There's eyeballs popping in people's head. Hands are growing out. They're getting stirred up. we got to go get him. I'm not making that up. It's in there. And so they go to death. So what happened? Jesus is going, he's been doing some crazy stuff. And all of a sudden, Jesus, age 30, runs into the camel hair bug eating Baptist. And so all of a sudden, the guy says, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. John the Baptist dunks him under the water. He comes up. Heaven splits wide open. God sticks his hand out of heaven and says, this is my beloved Son in whom I'm well pleased. And all of a sudden, immediately the third member of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit, leads the second member of the Godhead into the wilderness to square off against the devil. Why? Satan's been looking for God ever since the Garden of Eden because God told him in the Garden of Eden after Adam and Eve sinned, got fired a victim. God told him, Genesis said, one day I'm coming in the flesh and I'm going to take this back. So Satan knew God's coming, but where? When? He doesn't know. So in the beginning, man lived to be 900 years of age, 700 years of age, 500 years of age. People say, well, the ozone's killed them all. No, it didn't. Satan's a murderer, a thief, and a liar. He hates everybody. What's he been looking for? He's been looking for the Son of God. So I said, he goes off into the wilderness. God stuck his hand out of heaven, not for humans to hear. He stuck his hand out of heaven. He said, okay, big boy, you've been looking for my son? Here he is. Bring it on. 
So if you read through the chapter, Jesus goes out in the wilderness and Satan's watching him. Now the devil's a liar. He doesn't believe the truth. He's a liar. So he heard this is God's son. He's been looking for him, but he doesn't believe it. So he's watching him. That doesn't look like God's son. That's some smelly Jewish flesh. I don't know what that is. He watches him first day. He knows he's not eating. So he's fasting. Well, there's only three kinds of fast. Three days, seven days, 40 days. On day eight, the devil knows he's going for the big one. Now the Bible says the devil's attracted to weakness. He's not going to hit you and I where we're strong. He's going to hit us where we're weak. Thank God the Bible says where we're weak, there will he make us strong. So all of a sudden, on the 40th day, Satan finally approaches Jesus. Now he hadn't anything to eat for 40 days. His stomach stuck together. He's got enough bad breath to peel the bark off a pine tree. <laughs> it's, it's a real tough deal out there. He's not living in a Winnebago. Satan approaches him, are you the Son of God? You don't look like the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, turn some rocks into bread. And we'll eat lunch, talk over old times. And three times the devil hit him, three times for the first time in recorded Scripture, a man spoke back to the devil and said, it is written, it is written, it is written. And he quoted the Word, and the devil left him for a season. The devil cannot handle the spoken Word of God. It hurts him. It doesn't hurt his feeling. It tangibly hurts him. It's the only offensive weapon you and I possess. So they all leave. The angels came to fix Jesus' lunch. Now I'm trying to imagine the conversation. Jesus is there. He hadn't eaten in 40 days. The angels are fixing him lunch. The devil's hoofing it across the horizon. I can just hear Jesus say, did you boys see that? Well, yes, Lord, we were watching. We are waiting on you to call us. There are thousands of us, but you never asked. Yeah, I whipped him. Yes, you did, Master. Way to go. You whipped him. No, you don't understand. I didn't whip him as God. I whipped him as a man with the Word of God. And soon there'll be millions of us and the gates of hell will not prevail against us. Jesus came to build a church. Now, when we teach that, here's what I realize. You've got to start early. Uh, Isaiah 54, 13, all of our children should be taught of the Lord. Great will be their peace and undisturbed composure. Isaiah 28, 9, whom shall we teach the deep doctrines of God? Those who went from their mothers, line up on line, precept on precept. When I was a child, they didn't allow us to get saved in church till we were 12. They didn't think we understood. You know, well, I understood early, but they wouldn't let us get saved. No, you're not 12 yet. You can't, you can't get born again yet. And we could not take communion until we were 12. Man, I couldn't wait to take communion because I grew up watching Roy Rogers, Gene Autry, and, you know, John Wayne. I wanted a shot glass. The only place I had a shot glass was church. <laughs> and so, you know, you kind of get that shit, you had to walk down front and get saved to get the shot glass. And so me and Mike Blake, my buddy, we turned 12 on the same week, getting saved on Sunday. Me too, man, we're getting saved on Sunday. And then we, now I was convicted. I cried. I knew I, I don't want to go to hell. I don't, really, I don't really don't love Jesus that much, but I don't want to go to hell. So I walked down front and Gave my heart to Jesus, Pastor Aiken prayed over me. All of our family's there, they're thanking and rejoicing. And, and they hand you the bread and the cup while you're down there. Nobody can see you're down here under this crowd. And so, me and old Mike, we ate the bread, took the cup, and the first thing we did after we got saved is we, we stole a shot glass. We just shoved it in our jean pocket. And what you doing? You got saved. I, I stole a shot glass. I still have it today. I never did take it back. I sort of kept it as a memento. And the reason I'm sharing that story is this. Every child has to grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus. That's why he's got to hang out with believers and Watch what he feeds on, what he looks at, what he reads, what he thinks about, what he listens to. We are, we are a result of everything we fed on. Out of the bones of the heart, the mouth will speak. So we began teaching marriage seminars, our parenting seminars before the marriage. It was Luke 2.52. It's the next part. It says, Jesus grew, Jesus grew in wisdom, stature, favor with God and favor with man. Well, if Jesus grew, my kids need to grow. If my kids are going to grow, they're going to watch me grow. I'm the example, so I better keep growing. So here it is. Now this is a whole eight-hour seminar. You can get off our table. It's in this book called Goes. God knows how to raise your kids even if you don't. It's really, really good. But here's what it is. Jesus grew in wisdom. Now what is that? Well, Proverbs says there's four kinds of kids. Wise, simple, foolish, and scornful. There's dozens of scriptures for each one. You want to be wise. Wise people live long, have a lot of money, and they can storm the gates of a city. I want wise children, not, not simple-minded, not foolish, not, not scornful kids. Bad things happen because you a lot of money. Where do your wisdom come from? Well, the Bible says if you lack wisdom, ask of God. So I pray every day, Father, give my children wisdom. And actually I pray this, Psalm 34, 11. Father, I give you permission, teach my children to fear you, for the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. So they're adults, so I still pray that twice a day over them. Teach my children to fear you. Wisdom means you have a vision for your life. Proverbs 29, 18, where there's no vision, the people perish. The problem with most kids in our country, they have no goal, no plan. They're just trying to look good and show off and wear their hat backwards and the britches of a 400-pound man and turn their music up real loud and, and dress weird. Why? They need, they need attention. God designed all humans to need affirmation and attention, but if you don't have it, you'll get it some other way. Now, we were commanded to get it by doing what's right. 
But if we don't know what's right, we'll do what's wrong. I did it. I dressed like Elvis Presley. He's still alive. We cut the muffler off our Oldsmobile and wore our hair real weird with lots of butch wax on it. We're trying to do curl our lip up like Elvis. I'm not Elvis, I'm Joe. We're trying to act like something that you're not. So I realized I need to make sure my children have a vision for their life. So we started early with them, helping them find out what they're good at. Your gift will bring you before kings, make you wealthy, make you famous. Not somebody else's gift, your gift. God gave you a gift the moment you were conceived. You might not be in the gifted class of school, but you're gifted. God said so. Number two, Jesus grew in stature. Now what stature is? Stature is kind of different. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 4 says, Parents do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Most kids in America have to get up with radar every day. Boom, 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 boom. What kind of mood is mom and dad in? Boom, bad mood, bad mood, stay away. Good mood, good mood. Get the list out, get the list out. Thank God our Father is the same yesterday, today, and feather. forever. God did not go schizo this morning hurling lightning bolts at somebody. God's the same all the time. If God's the same as a parent, I need to be the same. That means I need some rules, regulations, and rewards for my home. So now don't use mine, get, you get your own. But I've had three wheels in my house forever. Uh, I had a big poster board. I had it thumbtacked to the ceiling above every bed and every bedroom in my home. When my kids wake up, the first thing they see are the three rules for my house. Number one, no talking back to mom or dad. I will not tolerate that. Number two, no fighting with your brothers or sisters. No WWF. Don't get, no, not doing that. And number three, no telling a lie. Why liars go to hell? I will not tolerate lying. Outside of those three rules, I want you to have a good time. I want my home to be like a state park. Have a great life. Just do not do those three things I'm asking you to do. I had them laminated on the front of the bathroom mirror. I had them laminated on the front of the refrigerator and freezer. And for three and a half years, they were laminated and duct taped under every toilet seat lid. I have covered everywhere you're going today. Do not violate those three rules. So I told my kids, you got a lot of enemies. I'm not one of them. I'm like Santa Claus stuck upside down in your chimney. Ho, ho, ho. I'm good to you, but I do not tolerate you violating these rules of my house. We're going to live sanely and together. We're going to grow up and it's going to be good. The third thing says Jesus grew in favor with God. Well, that's pretty simple. All my children are gifted different. All of them. Different vocations. Uh, some could you know, Corey, who owns my publishing company, she was a C student at best. She's the only one of our six kids that did not go to college on a scholarship. Now, she got it halfway through because she earned it. But, and I said, baby, you've got a gift. I just don't know what it is yet. But God said everybody's gifted. Well, it was with her mouth, so she put it on paper, and she got a full scholarship for the last two years in school. Every child's gifted, but they're not all, it doesn't always show up at the same time. Children don't become an adult at age 18. I don't know who came up with that number, but that's a stupid number. I've not met very many mature 18-year-olds, okay? You have to grow. So I realized some, every child's gifted to do something. As a parent, our job is to help them find out what it is. But what happens, we get frustrated. And i got a big family. I would hear the words at the family, man, kid, you're dumber than dirt. You're not going to amount to a hill of beans. I don't know why we had you. I'll be glad when you're out of the house. Well, life and death is in the power of the tongue, and you will produce what you say with your mouth. My Bible says this, if I fear God and delight in His commandments, Psalm 112, my children will be successful everywhere. I've hung on that. I've hung on that for 40 years. My children will be successful ever, God, you said so. That means my kids that lost, two of my kids that lost their college scholarships, I kept confessing. We had to go get it back. My son that liked to drive too fast, his senior year, he's captain of an all-state football team. You know, he lost his driver's license. They're driving too fast. Three speeding tickets in the month, they took his license away. So he's the senior linebacker. His mommy has to drive him to school his senior year. It's real humbling. What's that? My mommy, she's driving me to school. Well, I lost my driver's license. What was great about that, that's, that's been almost seven years ago. He hadn't had one speeding ticket sent. It, it, it burned it out of him. You know, mommy driving you to school will kind of take it out of you. And so God's just real good. And so I realized something. Every child's gifted different. We're not gifted the same. The gifts don't show up the same. And then the fourth thing is Jesus grew in favor with man. Now listen, this. there are more scriptures in your Bible on friendship than there are on heaven and hell. Because friends will take you to hell. And so we were very, very strict who our kids could and could not hang around. Uh, there are rules to the character of who you hang around. So we tried to make our home a fun place. I never allowed my kids to go spend the night anywhere else, but people could come to my house and spend the night. So if I don't know you're not spending the night over there, I don't know what to think, what to read, or what they watch. So I'm going to guard you. I'm going to launch you out to be an adult. I'm not hiding you. I'm going to prepare you. So we always made our kids volunteer. Never let our kids take study hall. You're not taking a study hall. You're going to volunteer to do something. Help out the yearbook lady. Help the coach out. You get somewhere by serving other people, not by showing off. She said, you want to be great? Become the servant of all. So people ask, what's your secret? Well, we just did what the Word of God said, and God showed up. We didn't do it perfect every day. I said, if you bat 333, they put you in the Baseball Hall of Fame. 
How'd you make the Baseball Hall of Fame? I struck out two-thirds of the time. What? Yeah, I struck out two-thirds of the time and I made the Hall of Fame. You're not going to do it perfect all the time, but you are going to do it good. Now I want you to stand up. We're going to pray something here. I used to hate going to the grocery store with six kids. I just soon walked through the valley of the shadow of death. <laughs> because I had six kids that could never agree on a cereal. And so I'd tell them, I'm going in and say, okay, get together. Before we'd ever get out of the suburban, we'd go every two weeks. We're a two-cart shopper. You get together, you pick one cereal. One cereal, okay? Well, you know, when I grew up, we only had like three or four kinds of cereal. Cheerios, cornflakes, and shredded wheat. That was it. Well, now there's a whole aisle. You know, how many shapes can you put this stuff in? And so my kids would come out of that aisle. Each one had their own box. Said, okay, put it up. Go on for the oatmeal. Get the oatmeal. Oatmeal's better for you anyhow. And so I'd always end up yelling when we'd come out of a grocery store. So we pull up. We're about to go in. And my wife said, Joe, before we go in, what are we doing about cereal? I'm not doing that about cereal. We're going to eat oatmeal until Jesus comes. They can't agree. Joe, you're supposed to train them. Tell them what we're going to do. I said, fine. So I looked over the back seat, all six in the back. So I said, get a piece of paper. Tear it up. Put it in six pieces. Write your name on it. Hand me that cup down there. And I empty, put your name in here. And I shook it up. Draw a name out. First name is Corey. Corey, you're first. <laughs> Sarah, you're second. And John was six. He said, what's that mean? That means you're not eating cocoa puffs for six weeks. Because <laughs> Corey, Corey gets to pick the cereal this week. Well, Corey loved Cheerios. Just plain Cheerios. Not honey nut. Just plain stick your finger in your throat Cheerios. So we go through, it's Corey's turn this week, and so we're checking out, she's hugging that big box, and I look over at Tessa, Tessa and kind of crying, what's wrong with you? We don't like Cheerios, me neither. Why don't you fast this week? Why don't you fast for two weeks? If you'll fast, we'll stretch this box for a month. <laughs> Maybe you'd like to use your faith and choke these skanky things down, because the sooner they're gone, the sooner we get to Apple Jacks. And so, so the next morning we got, we got bowls sitting on the table, Denny's always got the table ready for the next morning, we're getting up and getting ready to go to school, and so there's the bowls and the Cheerios are being poured, and all of a sudden... My son comes to the table. He went and got him a huge Tupperware bowl. You know, the old Tupperware, big old bowl. And then he said, John, what are you doing? No, no, leave him alone. We have a male in the house. We've got some testosterone going on here. Let's see what he's doing. So he set that big Tupperware bowl down in front of his plate. He poured a third of a box of Cheerios in that thing. <laughs> Come on, he got a male. We got us a man. Get her done, son. And about a fourth gallon of milk. And so we're eating, talking, and I'm not paying attention. So I thought, okay, we've got to go to school. Everybody get up. Let's go. We're going to school. Get up, get up, get up. And so I kissed Denise. I looked back over and I saw John's bowl is still full of Cheerios. I thought, you little rascal, you weren't eating them. You're trying to fake me off. I told my wife, put a lid on that, put that in the refrigerator. You can't do that. If you don't, I'll pre-soak a bowl tonight. You put them up. I'm going, he's not messing with me. Put that bowl in the refrigerator. The next morning we get up. There's more nice clean bowls. Everybody's coming in. Here comes John with another empty Tupperware bowl. Hey, son, we got you covered, buddy. Put that up. So I went and bought that bowl out of the, out of the refrigerator. And I don't know if you know what Tupperware does, but if you soak Cheerios overnight, so I set that bowl on top of it, and I popped the lid. Pshush. It looks like somebody's puked in that bowl. I mean, it's, oh, man, that's some sorry-looking stuff. I said, son, I suggest you eat this today, because it'll be worse tomorrow. <laughs> and so he's trying to eat it, and he's choking, he's crying. The girls, oh, dad, it's gross. Shut your face up, eat your shit. You better get them down, son. He's trying to, and finally said, can I be excused? Probably. I don't care. Soak them for a month. I don't care. Put a lid on it. Put it back in the refrigerator. Well, he goes back into the kitchen. We have French doors, and I just see the reflection in the glass, and I saw him set the bowl on the counter, open the refrigerator up, and he shut it. And that bowl's still sitting there. I thought, you better not pour those down that sink. I'm going to bust you. You better not. I'm trying to what he's doing. I saw him take the top off the blender, pour all the Cheerios into the blender. Then I saw what he got out of the refrigerator. He got the Hershey syrup out. He left out. Put the lid on. Poured it out in the bowl and drank her down. I said, my God, I've raised a genius. I have raised a genius. Because the whole goal in parenting is to train up kids to be a problem solver, not a thumb sucker. I tell him, honey, God's for you. He's with you. You can't go anywhere. He's not already at. He gives you divine favor. He gives you liberal wisdom. Your job in life is to fix stuff, not gripe about stuff. Get out there and be a blessing to somebody. People are going to hug your neck, and they'll give you a raise. I guarantee you. Bow your heads. Father, we thank you for the truth of your word that sets us free and keeps us free. And Lord, we say, without you, we cannot do anything but with you all things are possible. So Lord, we bring our families to the altar of God. We plead the blood of Jesus over all of them, Father. We declare we're blessed and highly favored. May this year become a jubilee year for our homes. May you make the devil pay back seven times whatever he stole from us. And Lord, may our seed be what you promised, Father. May our seed be mighty upon this planet. May our children become successful everywhere in Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Every head bowed just for 60 seconds. Every head bowed, every eye closed just for one minute. Nobody look at two questions. Are you here this morning? You say, Joe, I do not know Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I have never, ever asked him into my heart, but God's been dealing with me, and I'd like to do something about that this morning. 
If that's you, I would like to pray a 30-second prayer over you right out of the book of Romans. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way. I'm not going to call you out. I'm not going to call you forward. Men really don't save men. God saves men. But if that's you, in just a few seconds, I'm simply going to ask you to raise your hand and wave it at me real good and put it right back down. I'm going to see it. God's going to see it. If you're willing to acknowledge you need a Savior, God in heaven will save you right where you stand. Old things will pass away. All things will become new. God will make you a new creature in Christ. It's that simple. Or perhaps you're here today and say, Joe, I'm saved. I've just not been living for God lately. My life's not turned out quite like I thought. But Joe, I've been stirred this morning. I, I'm ready to get serious with Jesus. Well, if that's you, you can pray the exact same prayer. We're going to pray with these other people out of Romans, and God in heaven will forgive you every sin you have ever committed in a moment of time. Take your sin as far as the east is from the west. He will put it in the depths of the sea. There'll be no record of your sin in heaven, and God will make the devil pay back seven times whatever he stole from you. So with every head bowed and every eye closed, said, Joe, that's me. I need to get saved this morning. Would you pray that prayer over me? Or, Joe, that's me. I want to rededicate my life. I'm ready to get serious to Jesus. If that's you on either count right now, would you simply just get your hand up and wave it up real good and put it right back down? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for thank you. Thank you there for your bonus. Anyone else? It'll never get easier than this. God does the saving. God does the forgiving. He just needs your permission. Anyone else before we pray? Joe, I'm not raising my hand yet. Please include me in your prayer. Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, thank you. All right, hands down, heads bowed, eyes closed. Here's what we're going to do. Those of you that raised your hands, we are going to pray with you. And God's going to do the two greatest miracles he can do, save souls and forgive sins. So people are going to help them pray. I want everybody in here to say this after me. Heavenly Father, I thank you for Jesus. I do believe he is your son. He died for me. You raised him from the dead. I ask him now, Lord Jesus, come into my heart. Save me. Forgive me of my sin. I receive you by faith with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Now, Father, for the hands that went up this morning, either for the first time ever or as a simple reaffirmation of their faith in you, according to your holy word and their obedience as of right now, they are cleansed, forgiven, blood-bought, born-again children of God. Jesus Christ is their Lord. The devil's not their Lord anymore. They are your sheep. You are their shepherd. They're going to hear your voice. And the voice of a stranger they will not follow. As they lead today, Father, would you surround them with a shield of divine favor? May people begin to look at them with a new set of eyes. And Father, would you bring godly friends into their life that would strike iron with them and cause them to grow and become what you want them to be? We thank you for them in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise Amen. God. Pastor. Thank you so much, Pastor Joe. Really appreciate that word today. Real practical, pragmatic, and um, if I'm going to ask her, the prayer team to make their way up. We want to always have an opportunity. If you need prayer for anything, sometimes you need someone to touch and agree with you on something. I'm going to ask our prayer team to come up as we uh, sing our one last song. And if you made that decision today, and our connection card says, I accepted Christ today as my Savior for the first time, or recommitted my life, would you do us a favor and fill that out? We want to help you out. Um, we have want to send you something. If you want to talk to some of the folks here at your front, or if you want to fill this card out, and put it in one of the brown boxes as you leave. We'd appreciate that. And so we just we thank God for the decisions being made today. God calls you, and God is calling your name. It wasn't your idea. God's calling your name this morning. So we thank God for that. So let's go ahead and do that if you need prayer for anything else. Otherwise, let's have a closing song. Thank you.
continue to have our prayer team up here. Do you pray for anything at all? Otherwise, we're going to dismiss you quietly. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he shine his face upon you and give you grace in all that you do. Amen? Look forward to seeing you at uh, Grove Track 301 at uh, 1230 if you'd like to come to that. Otherwise, we dismiss you. We have the prayer team up here. God bless you.